Tax Issues for the New Economy. Good morning, this is Roger Royce, founder of the Royce Law Firm, a corporate business and tax firm with offices in Menlo Park, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And today we are continuing our series on the new gig sharing, peer-to-peer, -peer, and innovation economy with a session today on tax issues. Uh, we are a tax law firm, so this is something that an issue that looms large with us and all of the structuring that we do. So we're going to take a full hour to 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 go over the tax issues. Uh, but you'll see, even though we have an hour, we're really just hitting the high points. I want to remind people that this is part of a series uh, on the gig economy. Our last uh, program in the series will be on October 19, where we're going to discuss discuss employment law issues in the new economy. Um, also, as part of our webinar series on October 11, uh, Jonathan Baer will be here to discuss his new book, Decoding Silicon Valley. I hope you can join us for that. And then on November 21st, uh, we have a program on disaster response and what you should do in the event of a natural disaster. If you're tweeting today, use hashtag Royce University, Royce with an S, Royce University. Uh, you can tweet to us at Royce University on Twitter. The program is being recorded. It'll be posted on Royce University webinar site, uh, RoyceUniversity.com. You'll also find it on the Royce Law Firm YouTube channel. Uh, the audio will be available for download as a podcast in the iTunes store, and you'll find the slides on SlideShare. And if you'd like a copy of the slides, just email me and I'll provide those to you. So I am going to start with a few issues um, uh, and then uh, follow up with two of the tax associates in our firm. Um, you all know me. I'm the founder of the firm. I work with a variety of businesses. I've been doing this for 30 years in multiple markets uh, throughout the world. And uh, these days, what we do is primarily technology startups and the investment funds that invest in them, both domestic and international. Mark Mullen is a tax attorney here at Royce Law Firm. He structures complex, multi-jurisdictional, tax-efficient transactions. He's done work with transfer pricing, tax exempts, uh, golden parachute payments, M&A transactions, and international. He also works with intellectual property uh, including the taxation of patent transactions. Fiona Shu is a tax attorney here. She works with corporate transactions, M&A transactions, reorganizations, a variety of corporate tax and individual tax matters. Uh, she is not only a member of the California Bar, she is also uh, has passed the National Judicial Examination for the People's Republic of China. So I will start. And we're going to cover a handful of topics today. And the first one that I want to start, that I would like, slides are different. I'm going to start with some structuring issues. Uh, because as tax lawyers, the very first thing we, we like to think about is the structure. And I want to break this down into domestic versus international. So one of the interesting things that has come out of this new economy is we've seen the rise of, of a new kind of business, a platform. And we've all heard that, right, that the, the largest hotel business, Airbnb, doesn't own any property. The largest taxi business, uh, Uber and Lyft, they don't own any cars. Um, and there's a million examples like that. These are companies that are just purely platforms. And that creates uh, some really interesting tax dynamics right at the start. We have to, first of all, define what the relationship is. What are the parties doing? Um, Airbnb, for example, they're not a hotel operator. They simply have a platform, right? Uber simply has a, has a platform. And that's significant because it, it has a lot to do with who is earning the income and what kind of income it is. So, for example, I can think of three ways we could characterize. Here's a typical transaction. Customer contracts with the platform. Platform contracts with the service provider. Maybe it's a maid, for example, or, or a chef or something like that service provider provides a service to the customer. There's three different ways we can look at that as a tax matter. Number one, the platform is recognizing all of the income and then making a deductible expense payment to the service provider. Secondly, the platform is merely a collection agent it is collecting income from the customer on behalf of the service provider and keeping a piece of it. 
or third, it's simply a commission agent. Um, and it's just collecting a commission on a transaction between the customer and service provider. Uh, the way we characterize it is significant for lots of reasons because it will determine how much gross income is recognized by the platform. It also is significant for reporting purposes that we're going to talk about later. I'm going to add one more component to this slide to make it even more complex because one of the things we've seen come up in recent years is um, social impact companies adding a charitable or social good component to the transaction where a little piece of the income here ends up in the hands of a charity. And that can add an additional level of complexity. It's really it's exponential. Uh, just imagine that the platform collects money from the customer, pays the service provider, but also pays a piece of it to a charity or sets it aside for a charitable purpose. Well, who gets the charitable deduction? And the way we characterize this transaction is going to have a big is going to have a significant role in making that determination. Does the customer get it? Does the platform get it? Does the service provider get it? So these are uh, issues that we work into the documents. Uh, as lawyers, we draft the documents that set up these relationships and um, also ensure that they have the appropriate or the, the desired tax consequences. This gets more complex in the international context. Uh, for the last 20 years, we've been talking about the idea of mobile income and how we can move that around the world and put that in different places. Um, now more so than ever, uh, because these platforms, they could be sitting anywhere. Those servers could be anywhere. And in fact, the markets are everywhere. Uh, these days, the smallest startup company will be going international almost immediately. So here's a very typical structure. Uh, U.S. parent company, we divide it into its domestic and its foreign components. Um, and we, I, I think it's now pretty much established that cost sharing is the way to divide up IP. Uh, in the early days, we did uh, transfers and license backs and things like that. These days, we're almost always doing cost sharing. What cost sharing is, it's where we take some IP and we say, look, you U.S. IP company, you own uh, all the U.S. rights uh, to this IP that we're about to develop and some of which has been developed. And you foreign IP holding company, you own all the non-US rights, or maybe all non-North American rights. And we will just split the cost of developing the IP, split the deductions, but also split the income from it. And that way we don't need a transfer and a license back and have to worry about royalty withholding issues. We don't have to worry about transfer pricing issues. Is the license fee correct? Um, we're just sharing the cost and sharing the income. Uh, and we're sharing the cost based on the relative benefit from, from the IP. Now, I would add uh, one more thing to this structure to make it look a little more typical. Imagine, if you will, that there's another orange company on the foreign side of, or we'll call it foreign holding company, uh, above the two foreign companies. Because we want to do what we call check-the-box planning. Because uh, check-the-box planning, uh, if we check the box, we treat the foreign companies uh, the foreign operating company is a pass-through and the foreign IP holding company is a pass-through. And that way, when foreign IP holding company, which owns the IP, licenses to the foreign operating company, which it's going to have to do, so the operating company can run the operating business, it gets a license fee back. We check the box. We can ignore that transaction, treat those two companies as effectively the same. And why would we want to do that? It's so we don't have any of this bad passive income in the foreign company. Instead, we just have one foreign company for U.S. tax purposes that has active income. And I say bad passive income because it's bad because it will be taxed back to the U.S. parent even though it sits over in a foreign country. Active income, on the other hand, uh, if properly set up, will not be taxed back to the U.S. parent until it's actually repatriated. So we get deferral. This is the game we all play, um, and uh, we've been doing it you know, since the 60s, uh, and it, it is still a viable strategy. The check-the-box planning is relatively more recent, um, but very important in this to, to keep the foreign income offshore. Uh, I will tell you that if you've been reading the papers, you see that this structure is under attack uh, by uh, almost every politician that's ever run for office. Uh, Donald Trump's tax plan would end deferral altogether, so it doesn't matter how we characterize it or who earns it if a U.S. company owns the foreign company, the U.S. company pays tax on it. Uh, the Clinton tax plan would take a little bit different 
uh, approach uh, and uh, uh, presumably uh, following up on the Obama tax proposals would would tax a portion of the IP related income back to the United States and the proposals in Congress right now would go a completely different approach and, uh, and adopt a completely territorial approach. That's way beyond scope. What we're going to talk about here, we'll probably do another webinar on that topic uh, down the road, but for now just understand that a little bit of international tax structuring is appropriate and typical in, in the new economy. Moving on. Probably the biggest issue that we have with uh, new businesses is this worker classification issue. And we've always had a problem. Uh, it's always been a tax issue as to how to classify a worker. Are they an employee? Are they an independent contractor? That's always been an issue, but it is really an issue now. And we have an entire hour devoted to this issue, employment law issues, uh, coming up on October 19. But for now, I'm going to focus just on the federal tax issue. So employee versus independent contractor, why do we care? Right? So employees, they all pay tax. They all pay uh, income tax. Uh, the biggest difference, of course, is who has to collect it. Right? So, um, so for example, although the employee doesn't pay self-employment tax, they do pay, uh, they, they will have FICA FUTA tax that has to be collected by the employer. And I can tell you that uh, this can be a this is an issue that can wipe out a company pretty easily. Uh, taxes, penalties, and interest on under withholding can be massive, and I will tell you why. The way it comes up is that if somebody is properly classified as an employee or improperly classified as an independent contractor who should be an employee, uh, that means that the employer hasn't collected the taxes that they should have. And if the employee didn't pay those taxes that should have been withheld, um, the IRS can go directly against the employer. The employer has what we call primary liability on this. They don't have to sue and try to get it from the employee. They first they go directly to the employer uh, and pick up their 100% penalty plus interest. Um, and that's what they will typically do. Uh, in fact, um, Savvy employees will sometimes go to the tax authorities first uh, in order to force that issue and to get the IRS to go after the employer uh, because how many employers are going to sue the employee for the taxes they should have withheld? Uh, good luck with that case. So this is a big, big problem for an employer. And once penalties start adding up, the underpayment and non-filing penalties start to accrue. Like I say, I have seen companies get wiped out by this issue. Uh, we're going to talk more about that on October 19. I'll give you some real life examples of, of how, how bad this can be. So it's really important uh, to, to get this right. How do we get it right? So unfortunately, this is very highly factual. It's very subjective. And frankly, to be cynical about it, it's somewhat result oriented, depending on who is making the determination. But the basic definition is that an employee is subject to the direction and control of the employer. Uh, so the question is, what does it take to be subject to somebody's direction uh, and control? Um, uh, does the employer have the right to direct and control the result of the work? Uh, or is it what work will be done and how it will be done? So for example, am I hiring you to give me a deliverable and you, you know, I don't really care how you get to it, I just want the deliverable, uh, or are you punching a clock, coming to my office, sitting there from 8 to 5, uh, and I'm leaning over your shoulder and telling you, you know, how to, you know, how, how to code? Uh, we have several factors. Uh, there's the control that I just mentioned, the behavioral control, um, whose facilities, uh, supervision, training, uh, the financial control, the right to direct and control the business. Generally, we, we say that if what you're doing for the company is its core business, you are more likely an employee. So for example, if I hire a plumber, uh, if I'm in the plumbing business and that plumber is doing plumbing services for my customers, uh, that plumber is more likely my employee than if I'm a law firm that just happens to need a plumber. That's sort of analysis. Um, and is the, is the relationship permanent, temporary? This is really important. Does the employee contractor have other, other clients or customers or, or people that they work for. Um, these are really the, the, the bigger factors. 
uh, that you see in this sort of analysis. Now, this is really interesting. Um, we have a way now, because this is such a difficult question usually, that you can actually go to the IRS, file a form SS-8, and uh, ask for a determination from the service if we're still not sure. This is, this is relatively new. And the IRS will, uh, what they will do is they will take that SS-8, and if you're the employer, they'll go back to the employee, of course, and get their view of this to make sure that the information is consistent. Uh, but based on this, uh, this SS-8, you may be able to get the service to actually give you that determination. Uh, they're going to want to know how the worker obtained the job. They're going to want a description of the work. They're going to want your explanation as to why you think he's an employee or a contractor. They're going to want you to attach any agreements that you have. So the written documents are important. They're not determinative, but they're important here. And they'll ask you specific questions about all three of these categories. Uh, behavioral, you know, work assignments, training, instruction, the routine. Uh, the financial control, who's providing, who's taking the risk of loss here, who's providing supplies, materials, leased equipment, reimbursing expenses, and also questions relating to the relationship of the worker and the firm, such as the benefits, uh, are there penalties for termination, is there a non-compete, is he in a union, things like that. So, um, so either the worker or the employer can file this SS-8 and get a determination from the IRS, and when the IRS uh, gets the request, they'll start the research, um, and they may ask for additional information uh, or, uh, or not, but at the end of the process, which could take a long time, it could take up to six months, you'll either get a determination letter from the service and you're home free, uh, or you just get an informational letter because it's way too factual, uh, which is advisory, but can give, it's non-binding on the IRS, but it can give you some comfort uh, as to the result. Interesting process. Okay, one last thing before I move on here. The R&D credit, if, if, uh, if you're in this Silicon Valley, you know how important the R&D credit is to everybody. Um, we uh, just, in, in, the, in the recent uh, uh, tax extenders bill, uh, we got some relief, okay? Uh, because now it used to be that the R&D credit was of very little use to our investors here because of AMT, alternative minimum tax, uh, and it is now can be used to offset both the regular tax and the AMT, the alternative minimum tax. A little side note here, uh, it is still uh, subject to the passive loss rules. So it's not perfect. Uh, it's not quite good enough that we're going to see R&D partnerships come back into vogue anytime soon, but we're working on that. Um, the part that's really interesting is this payroll tax credit. Senator Pat Roberts from Kansas uh, has been pushing this for a long time. He was here in our office a couple of years ago. He stopped and visited with us and talked to us about uh, this particular proposal. Uh, which um, Kansas actually, you might not know this, has a lot of uh, biotech medical companies, and this is something that was really important to medical startups because they don't have income for a long time, but they have lots of payroll. So now a uh, qualified business can claim a certain amount of its research credit as a payroll tax credit. Uh, my clients are startup companies. They don't have any income. They don't pay any tax. They don't care about credits. But boy, they do have payroll, and they do have payroll taxes. So. Uh, Really interesting development for startup companies. Um, and of course, the IRS has not yet issued guidance on this proposal, but has been asked to do so. Uh, Congressman Bustani from Louisiana and, uh, and Congressman Neal, uh, uh, one's a Republican, one's a Democrat, they got together and came up with an innovation box proposal. I had an opportunity to talk with Congressman Bustani a couple of months ago about this proposal, and he tells me he believes it could work. Um, along with the R&D credit in conjunction. And an innovation box is completely different than the R&D. The R&D credit basically provides a tax benefit for the costs incurred in, in innovation in R&D. Uh, the innovation box goes at it from the other end and says, look, we're just going to tax at a lower rate the income from the innovation. So both of these are designed to encourage innovation. Uh, they, they get at it uh, a little bit differently uh, the, the pro of that, of course, is that we have a real, a real benefit here for, for true innovation. The, the devil's in the details. This could be really complicated. Uh, other countries have, have all over the world have implemented patent boxes or innovation boxes. Uh, it's on the agenda for the U.S. It could happen here. 
Now, with that, I'm going to turn the clicker over to Fiona Shu, who is going to talk a little bit about deduction and loss issues that occur in the innovation economy. Go ahead, Fiona. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Um, this is Fiona. I'm going to talk about deductions and losses um, in a sharing economy. So there are the relevant code sections. Um, the general is under section 162 that you can um, take the deduction if you have ordinary and necessary expenses incurred in connection with the trade or business. On the other hand, living and family expenses are generally not deductible under section 262. And when the deduction is allowed, there are several limitations may be applicable. The first one is um, section 183, which applies when you engage in a hobby, um, not a business for tax purpose. And section 288, this allows certain expenses um, in connection with business use of home. And section 469 and 465 put further limitations on deduction of losses in a passive activity. So for people who engaged in the sharing business, the first question to ask is, do you have a business? Because um, many times a business started as a hobby, and um, it's often hard to tell when the hobby converts into a real business. But for tax purpose, the distinction is critical because, as we just said, losses incurred from a business is fully deductible and is deductible against the other income. Well, if you're just a hobby, it can never generate a loss for you. So the expenses incurred are only deductible to the extent of income generated from the hobby. And another difference is business expenses are above the line deduction, while deductions in connection with the hobby need to be itemized and subject to the general limitation on itemized deduction, which is 2% of your adjusted gross income in a given taxable year. So how to decide whether you have a hobby or a business? The question is a subjective one. Does the taxpayer engage in the activity for profit? The regulations under Section 183 provide nine factors, which includes things like um, whether you carry on the activity in a business-like manner and um, how much time and effort you have put into the activity and whether um, you have other income or you depend on the income from the activity for a living. But the decision is made case by case, and the question eventually lies on the taxpayer's own intention. So um, you can imagine that in practice, there can be a lot of issues for the test to apply. As a reaction, the regulation under one, Section 183 made an assumption that if a taxpayer make a profit from any activity during at least three years of the last five years, you are deemed to have a business. So specifically about the home rental deduction. In 1970s, there were outgrowth litigations under Section 183 in connection with vacation homes. So as a reaction, the Congress in 1976 enacted Section 288 to specifically disallow certain expenses in connection with business use of one's home. This slide is a roadmap to get you through how Section 288 and Section 469 applies in a home rental business. There are two situations that may trigger 288. One is by using part of your home as a home office. The other is by renting or sharing a home with others. Since our topic today is a new economy, I will focus on the second, um, the home rental activities. But I want to note here that taking a home office deduction is widely perceived as a red flag for the IRS office. And the rule put a heavy burden on taxpayers to establish that expenses are real deductible. For people who rent out your home online, like um, on Airbnb, all rental income must be reported unless an exemption applies. And the major exemption is what we master's exemption. If you rent out your residence for less than 15 days, it is totally non-taxable event. So you do not have to report income, no matter how big the amount is. 
and you don't take deductions for expenses related to the rental. If you do report income and you want to claim deductions, you should be aware of Section 280A, the gross income limitation. Under the rule, the gross income limitation was triggered by personal use of a dwelling unit as a residence. Um, I don't have time to focus on the definitions, but I want to point out the three keywords here. The dwelling unit, personal uses, and as a residence has specific meanings for tax purposes, and it is broader than the ordinary English meaning. For example, personal use not only includes the time used by you and your family member, it also includes use by others under home swap arrangement. And um, also if you charge for less than the fair rental, the rental period may be counted as personal use. So if that's a concern, a, a taxpayer should pay close attention to the definitions and do not just assume it does not apply to you. Okay, what exactly is the gross income limitation? In general, like a hobby, expenses deductions cannot be used to create a net loss for a home rental activity. The way um, to Section 280A applies is it groups the qualified deduction into four tiers, and you must take the deduction in the order prescribed by statute and regulations. So what you do is you allocate expenses pro rata between business use and personal use of your home, only the expenses related to business use is qualified deductions. And then you group the qualified deductions into the four tiers. Firstly, apply tier one deductions against your income, and then tier two, tier three, and tier four in sequence until the deduction reduces your income from the home rental activities to zero. Any disallowed deduction can be carried over to the next succeeding tax per year if um, assume that you continue to allocate and substantiate actual expenses next year. So the slides um, give some examples for each tier's deduction. As one can tell, this rule is complicated and it poses a heavy burden on an individual taxpayer to group his expenses and apply the deductions tier by tier. So under Revenue Procedure 2013-13, the IRS provides a safe harbor election for individual taxpayers. The taxpayer can make the election each year, and under the safe harbor rule, you just multiply the allowable square footage by the prescribed rate. The allowable square footage is the portion of the home used for business purpose, but cannot exceed 300 square feet. And currently, the rate is five US dollars per square feet and is subject to update from time to time. If a taxpayer makes a safe harbor election, the gross income limitation applies in a slightly different way. It is beyond the scope of the, rep the, the presentation, but um, just remember that the safe harbor amount still subject to the limitation of income from the rental activity, and um, any disallowed deduction under the safe harbor is lost forever, it cannot be carried over to the next tax year. So um, if you have carried over deductions from last year and you make the safe harbor election for the current year, the current over amount is lost. You cannot apply it against your um, safe harbor amount this year. Okay, that's enough for Section 280A. Um, I just want to note that Section 469 may also apply to a home rental activity because rental generally are considered as a passive activity. And if Section 469 applies, losses incurred by a passive activity is only deductible to the extent of passive income. The law makes it clear that if Section 280A, the gross income limitation applies, Section 469 does not apply. But um, Say if you do not have personal use of the home or the personal use does not meet the as a resident test, then Section 280A limitation does not apply, but you may still subject to the Section 269 passive limitation. There is a $25,000 special allowance if a taxpayer actively participated in a rental real estate business. 
and the modified adjusted gross income for the taxpayer year is less than $100,000. To qualify for the active participate, there is no specific hour requirement. But if the average period of customer use is seven days or less, or um, if 30 days or less and you provide significant personal services, the special allowance does not apply to you. And the idea is that the special allowance is only for a rental business. And if the rental is below certain period and you provide significant services, the rental is only incidental, incidental to the personal service. So you're not really conducting a rental activity. An obvious example for um, extraordinary personal service is the use of a hospital boarding facilities. The use of the house is incidental to the services provided by the doctors and nurses. The regulations under 469 also provides other rules and examples for the special allowance. Last but not least, record keeping is credential in claiming deductions. Under Section 274D, no deduction is allowed unless the taxpayer substantiates by adequate records or by sufficient evidence. It is not the focus of our, um, of our webinar today, so I won't go through the details, but um, it is important to note that the IRS and the tax court make a big deal of contemporaneous records. There was a case that um, the taxpayer wrote down notes each day for their expenses, but they lost the receipts, so the IRS disallowed the deduction. They went to court and the tax court ruled for the taxpayer, relied on the contemporaneous records even though there was no other evidence. So, um, of course, the result of each case were based on the specific facts and situations, but um, the takeaway here is the best practice is to keep contemporaneous records and keep all the relevant approved documents like receipts. Also, um, use apps to help you. Be reasonable to claim a deduction and be ready to tell a story. Okay, in the time left, I want to talk about choice of entity. For most of the small business owners, the recommended business entity is the S corporation or a limited liability company. The main reason is that compared to C corporation, S corporation and limited liability company don't have company level tax. And the incorporation and administration is relatively simple. It gives the owner more flexibilities in managing the company. Also, it's not very difficult to incorporate an S corporation or an LLC if you're structured and planned in advance. For the purpose of this presentation, um, I want to highlight two points for choice of entity. One is qualified small business stock, and the other is self-employment tax. Section 1202 and the Jobs Act provide beneficial tax treatment to stocks issued by a qualified small business. Potentially, you can exclude 100% federal tax on the first 10 million capital gain on qualified small business stocks. To qualify, the stock must be issued by a domestic C corporation, and the company may not have more than 50 million um, in assets as of the date of the stock was issued and immediately after, which means that um, including the value of the stock issued. The stock must be acquired at its original issue. You must hold the stock for more than five years before disposition, and the company must also meet the active business test. I should also note that the 100% exclusion of federal tax only available for stocks issued after September 27, 2010. For qualified stocks purchased before the date, you may qualify for 50% or 75% exclusion. And because the tax benefit of qualified small business stock only available to C corporations, some people suggest that C corporations should be a better choice for small business owners and startup companies. 
as Royce Law Firm, um, we think it depends on the facts and circumstances of each company. There are pros and cons for each form, but um, in most of the cases, we think as corporation will still be a better choice for small business. And the reason for saying that is, first of all, the beneficial tax treatment on qualified small business stocks subject to a cap. It is 10 million or 10 times of the stockholder's basis. And also, you can only enjoy the tax benefit in a qualified stock sale. Well, um, if you have an S corporation, you can choose between stock sale or asset sale. That itself gives more flexibility to the equity holder and the buyer usually willing to pay more in an asset sale because they can get the benefit of step up basis and more um, depreciation in the assets. And as we just mentioned, in general, as corporations only have one level of taxes in operating, while C corporations usually have two levels of taxes. Another reason we think S corporation could be a better choice is that by using the S corporation, an individual owner who also provides services to the corporation can manage to get a round of the self-employment tax, at least on part of the income. As Roger mentioned um, in the workers' classification, if you're self-employed, compensation income is subject to a payroll tax substantially similar to the Social Security and Medicare tax that apply to employees. But remember, you only pay self-employment tax on earned income. So if you organize your business as a S corporation, you can classify some of your income as wage and some as a distribution. Only the wage portion of your income is subject to the self-employment tax and you will just pay ordinary income tax on the distribution portion. Depending on how you divide your income, it is possible that you could save a substantial amount on self-employment taxes. But of course, the allocation of the income must be reasonable. Generally, you cannot pay a minimum wage to yourself and at the same time have large distribution as a shareholder. And a similar scheme may be taken against the limited partners in a partnership as well. I won't go through the details because the situation for a limited partner is less straightforward than the S corporation shareholder. The net investment income tax generally applies to a limited partner because their share of the distributive income is usually considered to be from a passive activity. And the net investment income tax is imposed to equalize the 3.8 new 3.8% uh, Medicare taxes on compensation income and unearned income. But potentially, you can still impose the self-employment tax and the net investment income tax. And the opportunity lies on the disparity between the definition of a limited partner for self-employment tax purpose and um, the definition of a passive activity for net investment income tax purpose. I would say um, this is a gray area. Not everyone agrees of the interpretation. And um, the New York State Bar Association has submitted a letter to the IRS back in 2012 requesting guidance on the net investment income tax. So um, we should not be surprised to say that the IRS changed the rule in the future to ensure that taxpayers take consistent positions with respect to the self-employment tax, um, the passive activity rule, and the net investment income tax. This chart summarizes my presentation, and um, I will pass the speaker to Mark. Thanks, Fiona. Um, so this is Mark Mullen. I'll be finishing out the presentation with three topics. Uh, I will first be going over the reporting requirements in the new economy, and then discussing the special tax issues of cannabis businesses, which should be the old economy, except for only recent changes in law made them actually uh, legal. And then I will be going through state and local tax issues with the time I have left. Uh, so to begin, when I'm talking about reporting issues for the new economy, uh, it's not immediately uh, an exciting topic to most people. This is this is an expansion of the 1099 concept. Uh, with which most of you are familiar. 
Uh, the old news, which what you're all probably familiar with, is the 1099 miscellaneous. Um, these, uh, basically, if you're paying someone for services, uh, occasionally royalties or goods, uh, you'll often need to issue them a, a 1099 miscellaneous. There's actually three different provisions uh, that are relevant to the new economy that would uh, require you to file the form 1099 miscellaneous. They're not hugely different. Um, there is a priority rule. For instance, 6050N uh, beats out 6041 if both of them seem to apply. Um, but really, at the end of the day, you're still filing the form 1099 miscellaneous no matter which section you follow. Um, and so it's not going to be very, it, it, as long as you're filing it, it doesn't really matter which statute got you to do it. Um, but it does matter that you file it. Uh, if you do not file your Form 1099 miscellaneouses that you're required to, you will be penalized. It's not a lot per form, but it adds up. Uh, and you can have uh, over a million dollars in penalties uh, and fees if you completely blow your 1099 miscellaneous to a bunch of different uh, potential uh, recipients. So uh, I have in this chart a three uh, person situation where a 1099 miscellaneous would need to be issued. Uh, I also mentioned a W2, but we're going to disregard that for this presentation. Uh, typically a 1099 miscellaneous is more of a two person transaction in most situations. Uh, person A receives something of value from person B and issues that person a 1099 miscellaneous. Uh, but it can also, in, a, in what seems to be a three-person transaction, there may be a 1099 miscellaneous involved. Uh, here we have something that's like a, a platform economy, a uh, platform market. A customer has a contract with a company to get some sort of service. The company contracts out to a provider to provide that service or whatever value to the customer. Uh, here the company pays the money to the company and the company pays the money uh, to the provider. Uh, this would be a 1099 miscellaneous. Uh, really, the provider is providing the services to the company uh, on, and to uh, help the company fulfill its contract. Um, 1099 miscellaneouses get actually pretty complex when there's a lot of intermediaries involved. There can be multiple and not quite duplicative requirements, um, but we'll leave that out for this. Now, here's the new er, news. Uh, instead of the 1099 miscellaneous, there's uh, the 1099K. Uh, Congress passed this specifically to deal with advances in, uh, you know, e-commerce and platform markets. Um, when this applies, you are not supposed to file a Form 1099 miscellaneous. You are to file a Form 1099-K instead uh, and vice versa. Uh, again, this is important because if you're filing the wrong form, that's going to get you into a, a, a penalty position. So you better know when you should do which. So when do you have to file a Form 1099-K? Uh, well, uh, if there's a payment and settlement of a reportable transaction and that payment is made by a payment settlement entity, then that payment settlement entity owes the special reporting via the 1099-K. Um, so each of those terms, of course, this being tax law, uh, needs to be unpacked and has a semi-complicated meaning. Uh, payment and settlement of a reportable transaction, that part is not so complicated. Basically, that's the payment settlement entity saying, hey, we should transfer funds to that guy to settle the transaction. Uh, the reportable payment transaction, there's two kinds. There's, the, there's payment card transactions, like credit cards. Uh, those are not really our concern in this presentation, but interestingly, they're under uh, the same, same reporting regime uh, with, with some tweaks. Uh, what we're concerned about is the third-party network transaction, um, which I'm going to go into on the next page. Uh, and it's very relevant to platform markets. The, the payment settlement entity involved with a uh, third-party network is called a third-party settlement organization. Now, an interesting, uh, somewhat very uh, generous aspect of the statute is that third-party settlement organizations don't need to do a 1099-K for a payee unless that payee gets over $20,000 in gross over more than 200 transactions. Um, different companies, uh, different platform companies will often uh, just file it anyway, just you know, give everyone the same treatment rather than determining which ones are under the exception. And uh, in more complicated structures, there may be intermediaries that take over the 1099-K res uh, reporting responsibility, or in some cases, we'll actually have to file a duplicate 1099-K if there's an aggregate payee situation. Or well, not quite duplicate, but related. So as I promised last slide, I would tell you uh, what a third-party network is, and I'm a man of my word, so I will do that now. Uh, this is a third-party network, uh, and one way of one way of looking at it. 
Um, the, the basic requirements of a third-party payment network are as follows. Um, there must be a third-party uh, third settlement organization, a central organization, uh, which has accounts uh, who, with providers um, who are unrelated to the TPSO, who provide goods or services, and to agree to settle transaction for these goods or services pursuant to the terms of their arrangement with the TPSO. Um, unrelated it has a specific tax law meaning, of course. The next requirement is that the, uh, there must be uh, a standards or mechanism for settling the transactions uh, to the provider. Uh, the, there must be a guarantee that the providers uh, will be paid for goods or services, and this uh, cannot be the mere issuance of payment cards. Um, it's clear that this does apply to many platform markets, um, and you can include these terms that make it a third-party network in the terms of use themselves. Uh, the IRS has ruled uh, consistently with that and a non-binding, non-precedential ruling. Um, yeah, and, and another thing is to note is that there really does, isn't a focus on the relationship to the customer in the central organization and the definition of a third-party network. And uh, there's no focus on what else the third-party settlement organization is doing in addition to the third-party network transaction. Now, uh, one of the things I've put up here is that there's a direct contract between the customer and provider, and that's not formally a part of the definition of a third-party network model. Um, so why is it up there? Well, the IRS has looked to this a lot in its private rulings on this issue to determine whether there's a third-party network. Uh, for instance, in a situation where a third-party settlement or, or, you know, a central organization contracted with a customer and a provider, the customer's contract said, hey, you're going to pay us for this stuff and we're going to pass them on to the provider who provides you uh, this stuff. Uh, the IRS said, because that is not a direct contract between the customer and provider, uh, this is not really a third-party network. So this is not going to be subject to 1099K reporting. So what is a direct contract? Um, well, it does seem to be important that providers set their own prices. The IRS has cited that very favorably as showing that there's a direct contract relationship. Um, but otherwise, you know, we, we've seen the facts in the cases, but we don't exactly know what it takes. Now, to, to step back and pontificate for a brief moment, um, I think that this is actually one of the better legal analysis of what a platform market is. You know, in a lot of areas, we're stuck with application issues where we have, you know, we're trying to apply outdated legal analysis to what's essentially a pretty new idea. And you get to see that what a, a, a third party or a platform market really is, is a place for trading uh, contracts, in a sense, sort of similar to a derivatives market. Like in a derivatives market, these contracts are standardized, so they're fungible. Uh, that removes transaction costs, so if someone wants a specific derivative, they just buy a pre-made contract from another person. Um, that's more or less what's going on here. Uh, the, the third parties, the platform market uh, limits the kind of contracts that can be done over the platform. The only thing is that, you know, service contracts can't really be made fully fungible. They just can't. You know, your driver might not be that near you, so you can't get, you know, Uber can't just give you a, a contract from a guy in New York. It needs to give you a little more than that. Uh, and so what it does is it uses technology to settle the rest of those transaction costs that can't be settled by making the contracts fungible. Um, and so it is very key to look at the, the contracting that's going on here as that what, that's what really differentiates and defines, to my mind, a, a platform market. Um, businesses, of course, and firms and an employment relationship are also trying to minimize transaction costs, but they're doing it through making a hierarchy, through making cooperation, and just a very different process. Um, I, there's no real breakthrough in what I'm saying. I'm just, I think that this is a good start for those of us who are concerned that the law is falling way behind the market this is sort of a good start, a little bit encouraging to see the law doing something that seems a little bit innovative and accurate to the actual market. So from here, I'm going to move on to uh, Canada business taxation under Section 280E. Um, this is uh, an interesting provision. These guys have a very unique struggle thanks to Section 280E. So back in the 80s, um, Congress added Section 280E to the code because they didn't really like drug traffickers taking business deductions. This actually is a case, Edmondson, where a, you know, a drug dealer got in trouble and was like, well, at least you know, I shouldn't pay so much in taxes because you know, I, and I was putting money into this business. I'm a good business owner. And the tax court was like, yeah, that's technically the tax law. You get all those deductions. Um, so 280E comes along and says, for people who are involved, uh, you know, for a 
trader business that consists of trafficking and controlled substances, illegal under federal or state law, uh, they can't get deductions or credits. Um, so this, of course, immediately brings a planning opportunity to mind. Maybe we can split off parts of the business as a non-trafficking business. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about how that turns out later. Uh, now, the most important limitation to Section 280E is not in the text that I just had on the previous slide. It's in the Constitution. Uh, Congress is limited by the 16th Amendment. They, they, according to the 16th Amendment, it gives them the power to tax income without direct apportionment. So that's, that's all it gives them. They can't tax a broader tax base than income. Uh, so to preclude constitutional challenge, according to the legislative history and according to case law, which has agreed with the legislative history, 280E does not block reductions in gross income from the cost of goods sold. That is, when you make inventory, when you're producing it, some of the cost you spend on that inventory is capitalized into that inventory, and you get a return of capital when you finally sell that inventory. Um, yeah, so this is this is the bare minimum. This is the biggest tax base that Congress has under the 16th Amendment. Uh, net income that involves deductions and credits, those are legislative grace. Congress doesn't have to give those to you. Um, so the way that cannabis businesses have handled this is that they've tried to maximize their cost of goods sold. Uh, they're the only industry ever that's wanted to capitalize costs, um, so good for them. Uh, then the way that they've done this is by taking, you know, relatively aggressive positions in capitalization. You know, every cost is capitalizable or that's what they want. Um, and then they can even have some transfer pricing planning to, you know, between related parties to sort of get the highest arm's length price applicable uh, for certain costs that are capitalizable. So how have these different planning opportunities gone? Well, um, the, the business splitting has only had really two cases on it, and it's worked once, and it's failed miserably in another. Um, again, this sort of has the same definition of a business as, as Fiona talked to earlier with, a, with regards to hobby losses. A business is an activity entered into with the dominant hope of, uh, and intent of achieving a profit. Um, but then the issue here is, what are separate businesses? If you're doing two businesses, what makes them not really just one interrelated business, you know? Um, and the, the view that Champ take, took is that uh, it's a, a question of fact that depends on the degree of economic interrelationship between the two undertakings. So in Champ, uh, the, the, the taxpayer had a cannabis dispensary and also had a caregiving facility with its own fees. Um, the court agreed that these were truly separate businesses. Uh, they had separate books and records, which they found important. And if, you know, if the cannabis dispensary went away, uh, the, the caregiving facility would stand on its own. Now, Olive versus Commissioner did not have this. The, uh, there, the taxpayer had a dispensary um, and that had a, a lounge next door, which didn't sell anything, didn't make any money, and was just a place to hang out uh, effectively and use their products. Uh, the court understandably said that this really wasn't a separate business. It's entirely dependent on the first one. And so in a lot of ways, the two are not very helpful. It would have been really hard to understand why the, the lounge existed other than to induce people to buy cannabis and, and buy more and hang out. Um, so who knows how far this planning will go. As for capitalization, uh, cannabis businesses, uh, what they would do even when they didn't have to is they'd apply Section 263A to increase the cost of goods sold. Um, this, uh, this provision came out in the 80s to standardize cost of goods sold and largely to make it so taxpayers had to capitalize more costs. And the legislative history, Congress also seemed to suggest that 263A made capitalization more accurate. Um, so I, the IRS released a chief counsel advice. This is a non-binding advice that more or less gives a legal opinion of theirs on a specific tax matter. Um, they, their opinion is that cannabis businesses cannot use 263A whatsoever. Um, according to them, 263A only added things to cost of goods sold as a timing measure. Uh, Congress did not intend to change the constitutional definition of you know, cost of goods sold or gross income with section 263A. Uh, so they take the rather unusual conclusion that only the capitalization methods in place at the time Section 280 was passed are okay to use for cannabis businesses, um, which is unusual. I don't know anywhere else in the tax law where you have to literally go find an old set of regulations and an old set of the code and apply it unless you're applying the law to a tax thing that occurred 
in the past. Um, now there's, you know, a, a lot of, this is a widely critiqued CCA. It'll be interesting to see how far this goes. There is sort of a circularity. 280E needs to know the cost of goods sold to tell you what can't be deducted. 263A A2 uh, basically says costs that aren't deductible don't become deductible because they're capitalized under 263A. So it seems to imply you need to know what's non-deductible before you can apply 263A, uh, which is circular. And a lot of people's arguments essentially come down to, you know, Congress can't say what in income is whatever it wants. There has to be some external limit, and cannabis businesses say that limit happens to give them a lot of capitalization. Now, I think that a lot of these arguments are sort of missing an even better uh, planning opportunity, which I've diagrammed in this slide. Uh, Section 280E only prevents deductions and credits, but it doesn't limit your allocation of income from a partnership. So the easiest way to explain what I'm talking about here is just to go through these two transactions. Um, say in transaction one, there's a cannabis business A takes in $100 of gross income. Uh, it then spends $50 in expenses to B, I guess B was providing services, and these are not, you know, these are deductions that are not going to be capitalized. So what happens uh, in transaction number one to A? Well, under 280E, with, uh, without 280E, uh, transaction number one would be, you know, A would have $50 of taxable income. That's 100 minus 50. Uh, with 280E, uh, A has $100 of taxable income because it does not get the deduction. So it's 100 minus nothing. Um, so that's obviously, uh, that's, I mean, that really demonstrates just how bad 280E's effects can be, that you could have double your income, your actual net income, thanks to the application of the section. Uh, transaction number two shows what I think is a good way to plan around it. Um, there, $100 of gross income comes into a tax partnership. Uh, the tax partnership it, it itself is the cannabis business, and it splits up the income 50-50 to A and B. So without 280E, A gets $50, and with 280E, A still gets $50, because, you know, 280E can't make it add back in the money that went to B. Uh, there's just no statutory authority for that. So we'll see if that becomes a planning opportunity. I'm hoping to set up some of those. We'll see if uh, state law becomes more accommodating, although maybe it works now. Uh, lastly, I'm going to do a real quick run through on state and local taxation since we're essentially out of time. Um, so here we go. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is that California has an entity level tax on LLCs and S corporations. The S corporation tax is technically larger in terms of tax rate, but it's on net income. So if you're not producing a lot of net income because you have a lot of expenses, the S corporation tax may still be more affordable than the LLC tax because the LLC tax will apply on gross receipts. So that's just the total amount of money in, period, without looking to any costs whatsoever. Um, this sort of ignores the, also the state filing fees and combined reporting and other complications, but, you know, this is a good start. Uh, California property tax, this is something that you're going to have to be concerned with if you're buying stuff to participate in the new economy. Um, there's, this is not particularly uh, special to the new economy. Um, Really, the only the, the the major planning opportunity in any of these situations is not to accidentally trigger revaluation. Uh, the way real property works in California is that uh, the tax the tax base is two percent of the original cost of your real property per year, or it's not two percent. Excuse me, there's a two percent increase per year um, uh, at most, so the tax base is limited. Uh, but it will be revalued. The original cost will be updated if there's a transfer considered to happen or uh, construction. Uh, the next thing I'd like to point out right quick is for multi-state planning, a state will only have jurisdiction to tax you under the Constitution if you have nexus. Um, now, nexus seems to mean different things for income tax and sales tax. Sales tax seems to require you to have physical presence, but states are challenging this. Um, and income tax seems to trigger if you just have enough of an economic connection. Uh, it's more complicated than that, but that's that should be a general good understanding of your exposures. Um, it is interesting that servers, having your server in a state may be enough to have a physical presence there. Uh, states have taken different positions on that. Um, the last thing I'll close with on sales and use tax is that sales and use tax doesn't tax everything. Uh, traditionally, it's only taxed the sale of goods. Uh, not services, 
And we have a lot of stuff in the new economy that falls into a weird gray area. I mean, what is cloud computing? Is it really a service? Is it a license? Are we are we kind of transferring software? You know, as, as you know, information services. Some state will even tax differently. Uh, so figuring out what cloud computing is, uh, and and characterizing your contract in a way to give you the best sales tax result is something that you should consider if you're in a cloud computing uh, business. And it's also interesting because you'll see that it has uh, some distortive effects. Uber is a service and Zipcar is leasing of goods. Uh, in principle, there's something very similar to the, about them, but they're going to be treated totally different on their sales and use tax. Uh, the last thing to keep in mind is if you have an innovative product, say you sell a product that collects data, and part of the sales price also goes towards the fact that it sends data to the cloud, which you analyze and you send back to the customer. You know, what have you sold to the customer, right? Have you sold the, the services in the cloud? Have you sold the product? Really, you sold both, but how does the sales and use tax handle that? Um, and different states disagree. Some will say you have to determine really essentially the dominant uh, aspect of the transaction and tax it all that way. Other states say you got to allocate purchase price, so we're going to just tax it as much as possible, um, which, you know, that's a state kind of thing to do. Um, and that's it for the presentation uh, on, on my end. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Fiona. Um, that's a lot. We, we, we hit the high points of a, a, a tremendous number of topics, all of these new issues that are coming up. and. Uh, Maybe, maybe old issues applied to a new economy. Uh, again, if you're tweeting, use hashtag Royce University. You can tweet to us at Royce University. You'll find uh, this webinar recorded on Royce University website under webinars, also on the Royce Law YouTube channel and available for download as a podcast in the iTunes store. And the slides will be available on SlideShare. And with that, again, I'd like to thank you, Mark and Fiona. I'd like to thank you folks for tuning in today, and we will now conclude the webinar.